Let me ask you about objects or one particular object from outside our solar system. We don't get to study many of these, right? They, they don't, we don't get stuff that just flies in out of nowhere from outside the solar system and flies through. Apparently there's been two mm -hmm. recently in the past few years. One of them is Amuamua. What are your thoughts about Amuamua? So fun to say. <laughs> could, it, could it be space junk from a distant alien civilization or is this just a weird shaped comet? <laughs> I like the way that's phrased. Um... So Oumuamua is is a fascinating object. Just the fact that we have started discovering things that are coming in from outside our solar system is amazing uh, and can, can start to study them. And now that we have seen some, we can design now kind of thinking in advance. The next time we see one, we will be much more mm -hmm. ready for it. Yeah. We will know which telescopes we want to point at it. We will have explored whether we could even launch a fast turnaround mission to actually like get to it before it leaves the solar system. Um, in terms of Oumuamua, yeah, it's... For an object in our solar system, it's really unusual in two particular ways. Um, one is the dimensions that we don't see natural things in our solar system that are kind of long and skinny. We see The things we see in our solar system don't deviate from spherical by that much. Um, and then that it showed these strange properties of accelerating as it was leaving the solar system, which was not understood at first. So in terms of the alien space junk, you know, as a scientist, I cannot rule out that possibility. I have no evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. um, however... So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I cannot, I, I cannot, as a scientist, honestly say that I can rule out yeah. that it's alien space junk. However, I, I see the kind of alien explanation as following this, uh, the Sagan's extraordinary claims mm. require extraordinary evidence. If you are going to actually claim that something is aliens, um, you need to carefully evaluate, one needs to carefully evaluate the other options and see whether it could just be something yeah. that we know exists that makes sense. In the case of Oumuamua, um, there are explanations that fit well within our our understanding of how things work. So there are a couple, there are two um, hypotheses for what it could be made of. They're both both basically just ice shards. In one case, it's a nitrogen ice shard that came off of something like Pluto in another solar system. Uh, that Pluto got hit with something and broke up into pieces, and one of those pieces came through our solar system. Okay. In the other scenario, it's a bit of a failed solar system. So our solar system formed out of a collapsing molecular cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes those molecular clouds are not massive enough and they sort of collapse into bits, but they don't actually form a solar system. But you end up with these kind of chunks of hydrogen ice, apparently. Mm -hmm. And so one of those chunks of hydrogen ice could have got ejected and passed through our solar system. So both cases explain these properties in about the same way. So those ices will sublimate once they've passed the sun. And so as they're moving away from the sun, you have the hydrogen or nitrogen ice sublimating off the sunward part of it. And so that is responsible for the acceleration. The shape also, because you have all this ice sublimating off the surface, uh, if you take something, the, the analogy that... Um, works pretty well here is for a bar of soap. Your bar of soap starts out sort of close to spherical, at least from a mm -hmm. physicist's perspective. Um, and as you use it over time, you eventually end up with this long, thin shard because mm -hmm. it's been just by sort of weathering, as we would call it. Um, and so in the same way, if you just sublimate material off of one of these ice shards, it ends up long and thin and it ends up accelerating out of the solar system. And so given that these properties can be reasonably well explained that way, um, you know, we should be extremely skeptical about attributing things to yeah. aliens. Uh, See, the reason I, I like to think that it's aliens <laughs> is because it puts a lot of priority on us not being lazy and we need to catch this thing next time it comes around. I like the idea that there's objects, not like, I, it almost saddens me. They, they come out of the darkness really fast. They just fly by and go and leave. 
it just seems like a wasted opportunity not to study them. It's like a, it's the easiest way to do space travel outside of the solar system. It's having the things come to us, right? I like that way of putting it. And like, it would be nice to just land on it. Like, and first of all, really importantly, detect it early. Yes. And then land on it, like uh, with a really nice like spacecraft and study the hell out of it. And, you know, I, is it, it's, yeah, it, uh, if there's a chance it's aliens, alien life, it just feels like such a cheap way, inexpensive way to get information about alien life or something interesting that's out there. I mean, I'm not sure if an ice shard from another uh, planetary system will be interesting, but it very well could be. It could be totally new sets of materials. It could be tell us about composition of, of, of planets we don't quite understand. And it, it's just nice one, especially in the case of a Momoa, I guess it was pretty close to Earth. It would have been nice to, uh, to uh, you know, it's like, don't go there, they come to us. I don't know. <laughs> that's what makes me, uh, that, that's what makes me quite as sad. It's a missed opportunity. Well, yeah, and and whether whether you think it's aliens or not, it's it's a missed opportunity. But you know, we weren't prepared, and we will be prepared for the next ones. And um, as so, there's been a movement in astronomy more towards what's called time domain astronomy. So, kind of monitoring the whole sky all the time at all wavelengths. That's kind of the goal. And so, we expect to detect many more of these in the future. Even though these were the first two we saw, our potential to detect them is only increasing with time. And so, there will be more opportunities. And, you know, based on these two, we now can actually sit and think about what we'll do when the next one shows up. I also. What it made me realize, I, I know I didn't really think through this, but it made me realize if there is alien civilizations out there, the thing we're most likely to see first would be space junk, my uh, stupid uh, understanding of it. And the second would be really dumb kind of, uh, you could think of maybe like relay nodes or something, objects that you need to have a whole lot of for particular purposes of like space travel and so on, like uh, speed limit signs or something, I don't know, whatever we have on earth, a lot of, that's dumb. It's not alien aliens in themselves. It's like artifacts that are useful to the engineering in the systems that are engineered by alien civilizations. So like it would, we would see a lot of stuff in terms of SETI, in terms of looking for alien life and trying to communicate with it. Maybe we should be looking not for like smart creatures or systems to communicate with. Maybe we should be looking for artifacts or even as dumb as like space junk. It just uh, kind of reframed my perspective of like, what are we looking for as signs? Because there, there, there's, there could be a lot of stuff that doesn't have intelligence, but gives us really strong signs that there's somewhere is life or intelligent life. And uh, yeah. That made me kind of, I, I know it might be dumb to say, but re reframe the kind of thing that we should be looking for. Yeah, it's, so the the benefit of looking for intelligent life is that we perhaps have a better chance of recognizing it. Um, yeah. We couldn't necessarily recognize what an alien stop sign looked like. Um, That's true. And maybe, you know, the, the theorists are, the people who sort of model and try to understand solar system objects are, are pretty good at coming up with models for anything. I mean, it, maybe Oumuamua was a stop sign, but we're clever enough that we could come up with some physical explanations for it. And then, you know, we all want to go with the simplest possible. We all want to believe the sort of most skeptical uh, possible explanation. And so we missed it because we're too good at, at coming up with alternate explanations for things. Right. And it's such an outlier, such a rare phenomenon that we can't we can't study, you know, a hundred or a thousand of these objects. We have, we had just one. And so the science almost destroys uh, the possibility of something special being there. It's like uh, uh, Johnny Ive, this designer of Apple, I don't know if you know who that is. He's the lead designer. He's the person who designed the iPhone and all the major things. And he talked about, he's brilliant, one of my favorite humans on earth and one of the best designers in the history of earth. He talked about like when he had this 
origins of an idea, like in his baby stages, he would not tell Steve Jobs because Steve would usually like trample all over it. He would say, this is a dumb idea. And so I sometimes think of the scientific community in that sense, because the, the weapon of the scientific method is so strong at its best that it sometimes crushes the out of the box outlier evidence. You know, we don't get a lot of that evidence because we don't have, um, we're not lucky enough to have a lot of evidence. So we have to deal with just special cases and special cases could present an inkling of something much bigger, but the scientific method user tramples all over. And it's hard to know what to do with that because the scientific method works. But at the same time, every once in a while, it's like a balance. You have to do 99% of the time, you have to do like scientific rigor, but every once in a while, this is not you saying, me saying, smoke some weed and sit back and think, I wonder, you know, it's the Joe Rogan thing. It's entirely possible that it's alien uh, space junk. Anyway. Yeah, I think, so I, I completely agree. And I think that most scientists do speculate about these things. It's just, at what point do you act on those things? Yeah. Um, so you're right that the scientific method has inherent skepticism. And for the most part, that's a good thing because it means that we're not just believing crazy things all the time. Right. Um, but it's an interesting point that requiring that high level of, of rigor occasionally means that you will miss something that is truly interesting because you needed to verify it three times and it wasn't verifiable. I also think like when you communicate with the general public, I think there's power in that 1% speculation of just demonstrating authenticity as a human being, as a curious human being. I think mm -hmm. too often you, the, I think this is changing, but uh, I saw, I've been quite disappointed in my colleagues throughout 2020 with, uh, with, with the coronavirus. There's too much speaking from authority as opposed to speaking from curiosity. There's some of the most incredible science has been done in, in 2020, especially on the virology biology side. And the, kind of being talked down to by scientists is always really disappointing to me as opposed to inspiring. Like the things we, there's a lot of uncertainty about the coronavirus, but we know a lot of stuff. And we speak from, uh, scientists from various disciplines speak from data in the face of that uncertainty. And we're curious, we don't know what the hell is going on. We don't know if this virus is going to evolve, uh, evolve mutate. We don't know if this virus or the next one might you know might destroy all of human civilization you, you can't speak with certain in fact i you know i was on a on a survey paper about masks something i don't talk much about because i don't like politics but we don't know if masks work but there's a lot of evidence to show that they work for this particular virus the transmission of the virus is fascinating actually the the biomechanics of the way viruses spread is fascinating it, if it wasn't destructive, it would be beautiful. <laughs> and we don't know, but it's it's inspiring to, to apply the scientific method the, to the best of our ability, but also to show that you don't always know everything and to, and perhaps not about the virus as much, but in, uh, about other things speculate. What if, you know, what, what if it's uh, the worst case and the best case? And um, because that's ultimately what we are, descendants of apes that are just curious about the world around us. Yeah, I, uh, I'll i just add to that, not on the topic of masks, but on the topic <laughs> of curiosity. That's, um, I mean, I think that's, a, a, astronomy and planetary science as a field are a little, are, are unique because for better and for worse, they don't directly impact humanity. Um, so, you know, we're not studying virology to, to prevent transmission of, um, you know, illness amongst humans. We're not characterizing volcanoes on Earth that could destroy cities. We and it, it really is a more curious and, in my opinion, playful scientific yeah. field than many. Um, yeah. So for better and worse, we can kind of afford to pursue some of the speculation more because human lives are not in danger if we speculate a little bit too freely and get something wrong. Yeah, definitely. 
in the space of AI, I am worried that we're sometimes too eager, <laughs> speaking for myself, to uh, like flip the switch to on just to see like what happens. Uh, maybe sometimes we want to be a little bit careful about that because uh, bad things might happen.